It's now my great pleasure to introduce Katrina and Phil from the Isopogon and Petrophily study group. Katrina and Phil, well known to many, are passionate about a wide range of proteaceae which they grow in their garden about an hour south of here. Many of these are great grafted onto tough eastern rootstocks. They do things as a team, but today Katrina is going to deliver their presentation. Thank you, Katrina. When we took on the leadership of the Isopogon and Petrophily study group in 2017, we had lots of enthusiasm, but little in-depth knowledge. We turned to the only comprehensive reference that we could find, which was um, the flora of Australia, and there's a couple of relevant chapters. So this was indeed a landmark achievement, and not just because an isopogon made it to the front cover. It was the first comprehensive update to isopogons and petrophilies since Bentham and Mueller, which was way back in 1870. And in it, um, Don Foreman published 20 new taxa. So there was five new isopogons and 15 new petrophilies. And one of these was really well known, um, but it had been waiting decades and decades for attention. And this was Isopogon gardneri, and it had first been collected back in 1933, and Gardner originally thought that it was a Dryandra, and I think that's probably because it has quite distinctive bracts um, that are similar to Dryandras. So it waited a long time, but it got there eventually. But however, we found that the flora of Australia proved to have weaknesses and gaps, and in fact, it was a bit like Swiss cheese. Um, and I think it shows just how much work there was to do, and I think Forma just ran out of time, as well as suffering from poor health. Um, just to give you a, a few examples, this is a, a reasonably common nodding isopogon that you find in WA, and it was discovered, first collected back in 1960. It was actually given the, uh, the pencil in the name of Newtans, which means nodding, in the 60s. And I, I guess I, I have to admit that that was before I was born. But by the time it was eventually named, which was only in 2020, I was far from being a spring chicken, so it had taken many decades. Here's another example. So these two isopogons were given the same name by mistake back in the mid 19th century. And you won't find them in the flora of Australia. Uh, the one on the left was hidden under another under another species. And then the one on the right was just simply given a label species A, only recently sorted out. And of course, as time goes on, new species come up and the flora gets less relevant. And then when we moved beyond the flora of Australia, we found a general lack of information Things like um, ecology or propagation, we found it patchy, unreliable, the information was difficult to find and scattered across a wide range of resources. So you compare this to other genera like Banksias, Grevilleas, Eremophilas, and there's a, a major deficit here. Black Summer served to highlight um, the situation. Um, for some species, we don't know whether they re-sprout from a ligna or whether they're killed and must regenerate from seed after fire. For most species, we don't know how many years it takes for populations to be, be replaced after fire. But while we're here, uh, I'll just give you a quick lesson on the difference between isopogons and petrophilies, which is a question we get asked all the time. So on the left, you can see a couple of isopogon species, and this is what they look like after fire. So normally they look like, you might know them as the ball on a stick, round ball on the stem. What we've got there, left there, is just a core, a bit like an apple core. What's happened is that the all of the outside of that ball has fallen to the ground and in it was a seed plus some packing material. If you look at those two sp Petrophilus species on the right, they look quite different after fire. And the only thing that's dropped there is the seed. So what's happened is that the cone scales have stayed on there. They've just opened up as if they were on a hinge and they've let the seed out. Here's the crucial link between knowledge and conservation. You need knowledge to be, to be able to direct your conservation efforts and also to be part of the systems that exist around conservation. As the saying goes, knowledge is power. 
So let's remind ourselves why conservation is so important. One in four isopogons and one in five petrophiles um, is considered to be under some form of threat. Now, five of these have been put at the very highest level of threat. And what's interesting here is that four of those five are from WA, and by that I mean Southwest WA. And that's because 80 to 90% of these taxa come from WA. And so that's why what's happening in WA is really, really important. Now, I won't go into it here, but just to um, briefly touch on the threats that are, are around in WA. The astounding flora over there is highly susceptible to dieback, Phytophthora in the Moma. It's extremely vulnerable to mining and especially climate change. And there's increasing pressures from disease, salinization, weeds, erosion, habitat fragmentation, and loss of wetlands. So these are the big issues, but it can be as simple as local land clearing. Um, road verges are critical habitats for a lot of the flora over there, including Isopogon's metropolis. And we've been observing the decline in these road verges over the years we've been visiting. And this is a recent example from the world of Dryandra. And um, this is um, the widening of an intersection, believe it or not. And um, this location, this population was completely destroyed. And it was actually where the um, type for this species of Dryandra is from. So the picture at the top was before and then after it's been completely cleared. There's absolutely nothing left. And I don't know whether you heard this week, uh, as we did, but the latest information we hear is that all the road verges around Esperance are being cleared so that more crops can be planted. I guess it's just so lucrative at the moment. There's complex global and Australian systems around conservation. And it all comes down to identifying the species and then allocating a conservation status. All of this, you need all the really good information inputs. Um, and threat, the um, conservation status, is, this is very simplified, but it's basically threatened or not threatened. And then the threatened can be broken down into the critically endangered, vulnerable, etc. So that's what all of the conservation processes in Australia hinge on. So if something is classified as threatened, um, it's officially listed under legislation, which is different in every state. And then there's a Commonwealth set, then there's an international set of legislation. But basically what it requires is conservation activities. And again, you need more information inputs to determine what those conservation activities are and to monitor it properly. But there's another category that I've called here possibly threatened. And in WA, which is um, where these species are, they call them priority flora. Now, what they are is that they've given them a priority status of one to three, but they're all considered to be data deficient. So the reason why they're not, they can't be put into the threatened category and subject to all that legislation is because they need more information. There we've got a major gap, which leads us on to the current information gaps. So what are they? We've still got um, major gaps in the taxonomy. For example, these species are known, but they just need the research to be done to be uh -huh. properly described and named. So we know that we think these are probably species and they've got a conservation status, but really there's not much information about them. You can see they don't have a proper species name yet. They're just given a, a placeholder name and species can stay on this list for years and years and years and years. But there is good news here. Um, since we've been looking at this list, it's actually been steadily decreasing. And those four isopogons, um, we just learned recently that the botanists in WA have been studying them and hopefully they'll, they'll publish so soon with proper species name and proper descriptions. But it's, it's not all cut and dried even when you've got a species name. These are groupings where there's no question marks so some species might need to be broken up into a number of different species. Others might need to be dropped as a distinct entity. And the other thing that's changing taxonomy is um, DNA testing, which has now become standard. Hasn't really been done much on isopogons and petrophiles. 
except for probably that top group, which is the most recent one that's been looked at. There's another group of species that we, we've already talked about, we've referred to, and that, that's those data deficient ones that are, they're, they're probably threatened, but they, they haven't been put in that official category yet. So we've got seven isopogons and 12 protophiles, all from WA, um, at various levels of priority within that. So by definition, we need more information on those. We've got a further isopogon, which is not considered to need more information, but it needs to be monitored. So it needs information for the monitoring. So the ecological aspects of these species, how they interact with their environment, has never been properly documented. And they're rarely included in scientific studies. We've already touched on fire response, but we're also really interested in pollination. How does it work? Who are the pollinators? There's floral colour change that we've observed. What's the role of that? There's things that we think might be in floral insect guides. How do they work? And then there's things like the seed. The, do the varying attributes of the seed affect dispersal and germination issues? We don't know. In terms of foliage, um, there's a, it's quite common to get colour change to this reddish colour and I've given you an illustration there of some delayed greening. So that's coloration of the new growth. But in isopogons and protrophiles, we also get this red coloration in dry weather or in hot weather, hot weather, sorry, cold weather and dry weather. And we don't really know why or how that's working. Uh, in terms of disease, um, we know generally that these species aren't subject to disease apart from fungal pathogens like Phytophthora, but we don't really know too much more than that at this stage. And lastly, animal interactions. What other species do they interact with and what role do they play? So we think that bees are the main pollinators. Um, but a really huge range of insects can be seen on these, these species and we don't really know what role they have. And we've even um, got reports of parrots feeding on petrophiles. For example, gang gangs on this side of the country, carnivores, cockatoos on the other side of the country, they've been seen eating petrophily seed heads. And I couldn't resist showing you this photo, which we think is really, really exciting. This is from the legendary Fred Hort, um, and we only came across it uh, fairly recently. And as far as we know, we think this is the first ever photo of a bee collecting pollen from a petrophily. And what it shows in great detail there is how she's using her front legs to grasp the pollen presenter, and she's busy stashing all the pollen in in the basket that's on her back legs. And of course, all of this is happening in a split second. So you can see that's an amazing photo. Propagation, now that could be really important for conservation. If we need to replant species in the wild, or establish seed orchards, or for ex situ insurance uh, populations. So seeds the traditional way that these species have been propagated. Now those five threatened species we talked about earlier, they've been extensively researched by a couple of seed banks in, in uh, Australia, but the rest of the species are basically up to the study group. And we still consider that them somewhat of a lottery from seed. Uh, even though we've been doing it for years, um, we think isopogons are easier than petrophiles. But um, the new information that we've got recently, which could explain some of our problems, is that less than 10% of the fruit have viable seed. I put it the wrong way around there, but it, it's... Um, so it's very low viability rate. So you can see that the problems that that's going to cause if you don't know what, what's viable and what's not. So um, more recently, we've been moving to using cuttings and here you'll get there's one or two commercial growers that um, grow some of the a couple of the spectacular species from cuttings, and so they've perfected that um, technique. In the study group, um, we find it's a mixed bag. Some species strike really easily, others don't. 
And basically, we've got to do a lot more trials. But where we had made huge progress in recently is grafting. Probably not surprised to find out. Um, and this is really important to try and get um, more reliable plants. So we need to do more trials, basically, there. We've done, we've, we had success with quite a lot of isopogons, 33 of about 50 of the taxa, and Petrophilus about 25 out of 70 so far. Cultivation, a large proportion have never been cultivated. You, you rarely find them in native gardens full stop. And we know they're difficult in summer wet conditions, but you won't find grafted plants in gardens either. More trials needed. Um, reference material. We, we don't have uh, updated overall keys for either genera. Um, both of them have had bits and pieces revised, but we don't have anything overall. And we don't have any um, reliable, uh, up-to-date references. Um, you can see the sort of list that we've got there. Some of my reading is the 1971 editions of Australian plants. And about the best you'll get is our, our edition of the Australian plants, which came out last year. So come and see us if you don't have a copy already. So it's pretty clear where the biggest gaps are and what the, the direction should be into the future. What we do know is that demand for information will increase. And we know that the threatened species are likely to need more conservation work. We know that more species are likely to reach that threatened status. Then we know that more species will come behind it into the priority flora lists. There's a botanical backlog at the WA herbarium, which simply reflects the extraordinary biodiversity there. And so that backlog we expect to increase. The overall need for monitoring will increase. And you can see that the role of citizen scientists like us um, will get more and more important. So in terms of our priorities, it's, it's basically to continue and expand the work that we're doing. We really want to uh, focus on collaborating with the scientific and conservation work, whether it's um, collecting selected plant specimens for herbaria, collecting DNA samples, which is a, is a big area. We don't have DNA samples in herbaria at the moment, apart from the um, dried specimens. Um, general population monitoring, field surveys, etc. Um, and we can act as a supplementary source of plant and seed material. Um, in terms of our research, there's a, a list of taxonomic issues that we'd like to look into. We're really interested in hybrids. Everywhere we look these days, we find new hybrids. We know very little about them. We've got a few cultivars, which are the best forms um, that have been selected for cultivation. We need to find more. And the forms, different forms could be really important. Now, they may not be considered different enough to be to warrant being a subspecies or a different species, but there's some evidence now that different forms could actually have different DNA and could require different conservation efforts. But I guess the most pressing need is for up-to-date accessible ref reference material. And um, we've been getting a lot of requests for when is our book coming out. Um, which uh, originally took us by surprise, but we are working on it. Um, but it's going to be a big job. Uh, we also have to think about what sort of presence can we have up online and how can we keep it up to date. And you could argue that we don't need new taxonomic keys at the moment, given that there's still a lot of research going on. But I argue that um, I think the lack of those overall keys is, is hindering the wider research. So at this conference, we've been asking, what can I do to make a difference? And many hands make light work. So joining the study group is a great thing to do. It's a relatively small group. And a lot of our members also do major work for other genera. So there's plenty of room for new talent. Um, going beyond the subject matter, we can use a lot of help with uh, this book that we're proposing to do. Um, we need help with advice, technical issues, support, financial support, anything like that, editing. Uh, we're going to need a lot of assistance. But we can all observe, document and share. So, for example, 
You could be part of a, a survey program for priority species like the Wildflower Society of WA run. And there's currently an isopogon involved in that. But you might just observe something in the bush or a garden or even a library or website. And it's really important to document that and pass it on, share it around, ideally pass it on to us. But uh, a lot of people put things up on social media, Facebook and Instagram. That's usually a beautiful, beautiful picture. Um, still can be very useful to us, but it doesn't need to be beautiful. And iNaturalist is a really great place to, to store your sightings, and that's accessed by scientists on a regular basis. And just remember that any increase in awareness and knowledge in the community helps to foster support for conservation efforts. So this program of work is all about collaboration and teamwork. We'd like to acknowledge the botanists in WA who've taken the taxonomy forward since the year 2000. There's about three of them who do a bit of work on isopogons and petrophiles, but it's only when they can find time in their work programs. Um, so we really appreciate their efforts. We thank our study group members for their input. And we thank ANPSA for this opportunity today and all of you across the states and regions for your support, donations and encouragement, which we greatly appreciate. And we do get uh, a bit of that and we do really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this presentation, then please subscribe to our channel. Other presentations from the conference are available in this playlist, with new ones being added all the time.